All right, guys, let's talk about tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is a bacterial infection inside your lungs caused by M. tuberculosis, which is just your bacteria name. Now, it is an airborne type of bacteria that are basically disease that you contract by breathing in the same air that someone with tuberculosis has. Now, everyone in nursing school and even some nursing books would say that it's droplets, but according to the CDC, the Center of Disease Control, you sneeze it, you can cough it, you can laugh it, it's an airborne precaution, okay? So, just again here, your airbornes are your MTV. So if you guys saw my video about MTV precautions and how you're on air with music television, you have your MMR, measles, mumps, and rubella, also airborne, TB, which is what we're talking about, and you're also your varicella, which is your chickenpox. Now these are airborne precautions. Now varicella, chickenpox, and mumps are also contact precautions. So, we have to put your patients in a negative pressure room so that all this air is taken out of the room. Now, just FYI, the other ones are droplet precautions, and I break those down into PIMP. So, you know, don't get mad at me. I don't want to see the letters or emails. Um, this is just a way for you to remember. So, if you guys remember Pimp My Ride, that show that was also on MTV, where, you know, you bring in your car and you get your car all hooked up, people bring in like jalopies, really ugly cars, and then exhibit that wrapper, makes them all fancy. So drop in that PIMP, okay. So I have an entire video on this, but this is just for FYI. So, what happens when you breathe in the same air as someone with tuberculosis? Now if you're breathing in the same air, let's say you go to the subway. Let's say you're in a bus. Let's say you're going to a hostel because you're backpacking through Europe and you don't know that you're in the same room as someone with TB. Kind of makes you scared, huh? Well, you breathe it in, your body takes it into the lungs, and it spreads through your lymph as well as your bloodstream. Now, your body's immune system is alerted. And those B cells now want to make antibodies against it and kind of spray this new bacteria with tags that says, hey, everyone else, let's go attack this tuberculosis, this invader. Uh, I have an entire lecture on immunology if you guys want way more immunology stuff at simplenursing.com. So what your body does is alerts the T cells, which are your natural born killers, which are pretty much the same family uh, as B cells. And these T cells go and attack directly tuberculosis. And your macrophages make a perimeter with your T lymphocytes, or basically your T cells, and they sustain and kind of quarantine tuberculosis. They can't kill it, they just quarantine it so it can't spread it out. It's almost like they put it in prison. They have taken it captive. And this captivity is what's called granulomas. And granulomas is pretty much a little dot or little bumps. So that's why when we take a x-ray, we see a little granuloma, a little bump, and that's how you know you have a positive tuberculosis reading, at least from radiology. Now we can also do a sputum test and test for that bacteria also, which we're gonna get into. But if you're doing the x-ray, we're looking for granulomas. So you're the nurse. You have a patient with airborne precautions inside of a uh, negative pressure room. You're gonna wanna wear an N95 mask, which is basically, you're not being able to breathe in the outside air through this kind of mask. You can't wear a normal surgical mask has to be N95 because you're, no, you're not wanting to breathe in that air. So next. All right, so now let's get into our assessments for your tuberculosis patients. So your patient comes in to the ER or you're on the nursing unit for the day and you don't even know your patient has TB. It happens a lot. Or your patient doesn't even know themselves that they have TB. 
um, or your patient thinks they might have TB. How do you know? What assessments are you going to do? Well, your patient comes in with a cough. Obviously, a lot of people have the cough during the flu season. But a yellow, bloody, tinged cough, and that's a great NCLEX tickler. Bloody tinged is uh, a key word. So your patient's with a bloody cough or bloody sputum, which is also called hemopytesis, a cough with blood. Same thing. Obviously, they're going to have difficulty breathing, dyspnea, really any respiratory issue has difficulty breathing. And you're also going to have pallor, which is just that uh, paleness of the skin. And that pallor is because we have decreased oxygen exchange. Your patient's not breathing in as adequately as they should be. You're also going to have what's called RALS or crackles. You can call them RALS, RALS, RALS. Every uh, part of our nation has a different way of saying medical terminology. If you're in Texas, RALS. If you're uh, somewhere else, I don't know. People always call them RALS or RALS. Oh, well. Well, these are two of the same kind of classifications of um, respiratory, what am I saying? respiratory sounds. I almost classify them as almost farts. Um, I know it's probably disgusting. You're like, eh, that's gross. But pretty much it's almost the same thing. There's a big difference between a baby fart and your dad's fart or a grandpa fart, <laughs> okay? Classifications, rawls are very bubbly, very coarse crackles, very hard, almost like a grandpa fart, like brrr, okay? Very deep, very gurgly, like that. Now, crackles, on the other hand, crackles are very fine. It's almost like the light version, the baby fart. They are short, discreet, crackling. It's cute. Now, this also is included with pneumonia, CHF, and also bronchitis. Now, when your um, T lymphocytes, or your T cells, and your macrophages are fighting off this tuberculosis inside the lungs, what happens is a lot of extuate, or extra pus, or basically the remnants of the dead battlefield of all these cells get stuck inside the lungs. And this is what causes the crackles and the, um, what's it called, the fluid-filled alveoli and the fluid-filled lungs. Now, rawls and crackles, you have to know they're two different things, but they're pretty much the same thing. You have a large and small type of problem. Now, just for your information, ronchi are snore-like airway secretions that are cleared with the cough. Your wheezes is almost like a whistle, I like that kind of. And this is usually from bronchitis, emphysema, but mostly we see it in acute asthma. And that's actually where, uh, what I had, I had, a, I had um, exercise-induced asthma when I was little. Now this is cleared up with our BAM and our SLAM drugs. If you guys haven't seen the BAM and SLAM classifications of bronchodilators and anti-inflammatory patient or um, drugs for your COPD patients. It's really good for COPD. We're not talking about COPD, but I just wanted to kind of clear up the um, lung sounds for you. So ronchi are snore-like um, sounds, respiratory sounds, that are cleared up with a cough. It's just airway secretions. Wheezing is that whistle, that inflammation in the airway that's tight. That's what asthma usually and then a friction rub sounds like sandpaper. It's very dry, very coarse. It's like sandpaper. And this is usually from pleurisy. Basically, we have lung inflammation with the decreased lubrication inside the lungs. So you have your lung tissue scraping together, and it hurts really bad. But in TB, we usually only have rawls and crackles because, remember... You have that war going on inside the lungs, and all that pus is gathering inside of your lungs, okay? So, sorry to go off on a tangent, but that's what it is.
Now next, you're going to have anorexia, or basically your patient's not going to want to eat. And this happens because you have a decrease in oxygen and a positive infection going on. And I don't know when the last time you guys um, were sick or you guys were under the weather, and sometimes you just do not have an appetite to eat, especially when you're sick. On the other hand of things, when you are hypoxic or when you have chronic um, inadequate oxygen exchange or your oxygenation is always low from, let's say, COPD, it doesn't have to always be tuberculosis, okay? You have to think entire picture here. Your patients lack a hunger. They lack the uh, desire to eat. So you have weight loss. You have a lot of fatigue just like in your COPD patients, okay? Now, with the infection, you have night sweats. And those night sweats only get worse. So your patient comes in for tests. And your doctor's going to order up a few tests. And as I said before, one of the first things we're going to do is do a chest x-ray to see exactly what's going on. Because honestly, it could be anything. Your patient could have a pneumothorax, a pop lung with air inside the lungs. It could be anything. It could be even a PE, pulmonary embolism. It is probably tuberculosis because we know that they're spitting up blood, blood tinged. So we're going to do a chest x-ray. We're going to see, yes, are you infected? Or no, are you not infected? But, let me scoot you over here. But, active versus inactive also called latent, negative tuberculosis screening does not always mean negative. For it to be negative in the latent phase, you have to have a negative chest x-ray, negative sputum cultures times three, and a possible positive PPD test. Now for active, you're going to have a positive chest x-ray and a positive sputum test. Now, guys, remember, they take three of these tests. Now, in the sputum test, real quick, if your patient's going for a sputum test, you're going to have them do the sputum test first thing in the morning so that you get all the bacteria that was brewing overnight. It's probably not something they're going to tell you um, easily in their nursing books, but that's one of the things that you probably should know for your test. Okay, guys, for your skin test, a red raised lump within 48 hours shows that you have a positive reaction, shows that your T lymphocytes and macrophages have surrounded and have caused an inflammation to this protein that they put in your arm. Now, for your sputum test, like I said before, this other test, you have a positive times three. Please remember that. First thing in the morning. You have to know that it's first thing in the morning. Now, those are the specific tests. Obviously, the other lab tests, if you have infection anywhere in the body, probably going to have increased white blood cells. And those white blood cells are above 10,000. But your next specific one is your ESR. Now, your ESR is your inflammation. It kind of uh, does a test, a general test of the inflammation in the body. Now this assists with the diagnosis of tuberculosis. ESR is your erythrocyte segment rate. It's almost like what CRP is for the vessels uh, for your cardiac patients. It just shows the inflammation. So it helps with the diagnosis that you are very inflamed. Now, these tests are used for your patients to diagnose TB. Now, something that kind of throws the medical field off is a decreased immune response. So let's just say your patient is on prednisone, which decreases your immune system's response to invaders. You had a liver transplant. This decreases the police department. There's no policemen patrolling the streets. There's a bunch of vigilantes and riots going on, 
and no one to alert anyone. It's like the wild, wild west. The sheriff is not in town and the hoodlums are taken over. And really, your body's not even putting up a fight. So liver transplant, patients on prednisone, HIV, you have a decreased immune response here. Okay? So there will be no raised lump with your PPD tests at times. Okay? This just means you have a decreased immune response. So what we'll do for those patients is we will do the respiratory, respiratory, we'll do the sputum test and test how much bacteria is in the sputum itself. Usually that one is the most accurate. Then we'll go to the ESR and test the inflammation. So let's go on into actions. What do we do for nursing intervention?